It's a great pleasure to introduce Bianca Zadrozny, who is a senior manager at IBM Research Brazil. Well, Dr. Zadrozny is a distinguished researcher in machine learning challenges. She has made important theoretical contributions to topics such as learning reductions, sensitive learning, and sample selection bias. But her work also encompasses in applications such as natural language processing and a number of topics relevant to Brazilian industry like energy, oil and gas, and such things. So Dr. Zadrozny obtained an undergraduate degree from, in computer engineering from the Catholic University in Rio, Rio. In 2003, she finished her PhD at the University of California at San Diego, where she was advised by Charles Elkin. And upon graduating from UCSD, she joined IBM TJ Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights, where she worked for a few years. She then moved to the Universidade Federal Fluminense in Niterói. And 10 years ago, she moved back to IBM, but to the Brazilian laboratory in Rio de Janeiro. And she'll be telling us today about uh, some industry-related work that she's done, uh, but th which has a very strong mathematical and learning theoretical component. And it's about, well, understanding how fast fires fare when somehow the distribution of the data changes. So without further ado, please be happy. Okay, so uh, as Roberto said, I'm a research scientist at man and manager at IBM Research Brazil. Today I'm going to talk about, um, uh, actually I tried to find the work that I thought would be more interesting for this uh, community of theoretical computer science. Uh, in the lab, we actually do a lot of applied research, developing machine learning models for different applications in um, the natural resources industry. And more recently, we have been focusing on uh, machine learning for climate modeling. Uh, this year, we started doing that. But I, I decided to pick a topic that was more uh, generic, uh, and I thought a little bit more related to the, the community here. And this work actually has been done in collaboration with uh, some uh, researchers in the lab, Julio Hoffman, Breno Carvalho, and Marcel Zortea. Uh, Julio actually just, uh, uh, he was a postdoc for two years with us, and now he's going to IMPA for, for a postdoc um, as well. So he's no longer uh, at IBM. And he did a lot of the work that I'll, I'll show here. Um, today. So I'll start with a, a simple uh, example, uh, start talking about supervised learning just to uh, uh, give the setting uh, of the work. So in the, the supervised learning setting, as probably most of you know, um, you have a, um, you assume that you have a training data, a data set, a label data set, which is a uh, actually a uh, sample from um, a distribution. Uh, and then you train a, a using a learning algorithm, you build a model uh, using this, this training data set. Your main assumption is that uh, after you learn the model, you're going to actually apply the model to some other data, unlabeled data that were actually uh, selected uh, from conceptually the same distribution. So here you would have examples that are black and white pictures of face of animals. Uh, they are described by a set of features. And uh, you assume that they have an underlying distribution. And when you do actually train the model, um, you assume that when you test the model, you are going to get the same examples. But the problem is that as people uh, have been talking about many times, may, uh, sometimes the training set is not, uh, uh, does not have the same distribution as the test set. So uh, this is actually being called by different names in the machine learning literature. So there's some name sample selection bias, where the, um, uh, you actually, evaluate the, sorry, you assume that you have the training data was there was some bias in the process of collecting the data. And because of that, you, you don't have an actual good sample of the distribution for each one wanna you know, use your test examples. But then when you uh, 
There are other names, for example, data set shift or distribution shift. They're more related to the fact that sometimes your training uh, was actually using a random sample, but there is a shift in the data and the distribution of the data. And the new test examples are not following that. But in the sen some sense, it is the same kind of problem. Uh, one is when you actually don't get a good, a good training set. And the other one is when you um, have a shift later in, in, in the behavior of the data for which you're applying your model and you get a, um, and here I put some citations. This is some very uh, work that I did a long time ago in this topic that is uh, became uh, highly cited. And then there are uh, books actually about the subject of data set shifting machine learning, machine learning in non-stationary uh, environments, etc. And there are some special cases of data set shift that, that you see in the literature. So for example, you have a class prior shift is actually when you only change the distribution of the labels. So you, you for example, you would have much more cats than dogs or much more dogs than cats, for example, in the test set or in the new examples that you want to classify than in your training examples. And that may lead to a bias when you're making the classification because you're assuming a certain prior distribution depending on the type of classifier that you use. And that prior, this in the face of noise, that prior distribution not being the same, you, you get more. So you can, there are procedures to change, to adapt to different priors, of course, depending on the, if this is the case. Then there is the label noise case where the relationship between the features and the label changes. So you still assume that your features stay the same the X here, the features, but the, the function that governs things changes. So the, in the examples of the cats and dogs, that would be something that's saying, oh, this is not longer a cat, this is a dog, for example, a certain example that changed the label. Someone discovered a certain species was not correct and changed, for example, the label of that. That would be label noise. And the covariate shift, which is, uh, a problem that we're going to talk more about in this talk is um, a shift in the input features. So you assume that the probability of Y given X stays the same, but that there is a change in the distribution of X values. So for example, you start getting some examples of cats and dogs that look different. They are not uh, uh, they're similar to the ones that, that you saw there. Uh, for example, they, they, a new uh, race of dogs, for example, that you haven't captured in your training data now appears in, in, uh, in your test data, for example, or some changes in the color of the pixels, uh, things like that. But you assume that the P of Y given X stays the same because if the, it doesn't, then you uh, have a more complicated problem where you're changing both the features and the relationship between the labels and, and the features, right? Which would be a more generic case of, of data set shift. So these are two, three um, uh, special cases. And, and uh, another concept that I'm gonna use more later in the talk that I wanted to present, probably people, it's a very common procedure in machine learning of how to estimate the error uh, on, a valid, on a given a training set, you want to estimate the, the generalization error, how well the classifier is going to do for new, uh, new examples, right? So a very common procedure is a k-fold cross-validation where you separate the data, uh, where you randomly select, in each of the folds you randomly select part of the, tr the training data for validation and the rest used for training. And you calculate the error, um, you train the model on the training and calculate the, get the error on the test, the validation set. This will give you an unbiased estimate uh, of the, the, assuming that the training data is a random sample of the, the true distribution. Uh, the cross validation is a good procedure because it, allows you to uh, use the, all the training data to train the model and get an estimate of the error on unseen data, which is the validation in each of the folds. 
and then you get an estimate of the there. Then when you have, for example, covariate shift, which is one of the kinds of um, uh, shifts that I, I was talking about, then you have to weight the, uh, there is a, so you can be shown that if you weight each of the examples by this density ratio, which is the probability of a, a, this example XI appearing in the test set divided by the probability of the training, ex the, of the example XI appearing in the training set. This is the, a way that you can uh, use for each of the, the validation examples here. And then you, you calculate your validation error uh, in this fashion with these specific weights. But of course, these weights are not known, right? You don't know, you get a new example, one case of a cat or in case of a dog, and you say, what is the probability that I'll see this example in the training set versus the probability of seeing this example in the test set? So this has to be estimated. And there has been a lot of work and research in machine learning covariate shift on methods for estimating this, uh, this ratio so that it can be used for different things. For example, uh, this for, for getting the error on the, uh, an estimation of the generalization error on a test set with covariate shift, but also for um, using as weights in, in classifiers so that you can train a classifier for a test set with a different distribution than, than the training set, for example. So there are many uses for this. And there's a variety of procedures for estimating these density ratios. So these are kind of machine learning methods as well. The kernel mean matching, Cobalt uh, library importance estimation, and least squares importance fitting uh, are different uh, examples and they have different pros and cons. I won't go into a lot of details just to give the background for the work uh, that I'll be presenting next. So, um, uh, in, so going back now to the, the main topic, uh, in, in the, the machine, in the IBM lab, since I joined almost 10 years ago, we have been working on a lot of geosciences applications. And uh, of course, in geosciences, there's a, a type of, you know, branch of statistics, geostatistics, that for data-driven models in, in the geosciences, was the more prevalent uh, kind of methodology, right? It was originally developed in the 60s to predict uh, probability distribution of ore grading mining. So we, the methods, for example, Krieging, they, they started with the, the, a geoscience application in mind, right? But then lately with the advent of modern machine learning techniques, including deep learning um, and other kinds of machine learning techniques, people started thinking, oh, we need to apply uh, machine learning techniques for geosciences applications, right? For instead of traditional statistics or, or signal processing techniques, because they require less parameter tuning, feature engineering, they are potentially more flexible for learning uh, anisotropic distribution. So, so people started saying, okay, let's apply, you know, neural networks, deep learning, etc., to predict, for example, or grade, right? Which is a traditional uh, application of geostatistics. But the problem is that the theory and the tools to apply machine learning techniques, they, cons they don't consider uh, some specific characteristics of the data in the geosciences. For example, spatial bias, spatial uh, uh, correlation that are uh, present usually in, you know, in the data sets that you want to apply. And they apply Sorry, they applied the models without uh, taking this into consideration. And it's difficult to, for example, estimate the error of a classifier learned for one data set to an, a different data set, considering that this happens. So what we noticed in the lab um, is that there was an opportunity to develop not only applications of machine learning to these, which we actually do a lot, and, and but I decided not to focus on this today, but also to think about developing new methodologies for data preparation, training, evaluation of machine learning models for the geosciences, which you name geostatistical learning. 
right? Because we combine some principles from geostatistics with uh, machine learning theory as well. So, okay, somehow this is covering here, but um, this is just to say that um, the tasks, the learning tasks in, in, in geostatistical learning are tasks that leverage the spatial uh, coordinates of the, the samples. So, for example, uh, in mining, one example of task, as I said, is to predict the amount of gold in a location in the subsurface. So usually you would have different kinds of data that you can gather from the subsurface, uh, such as indirect data that you measure, for example, uh, ma uh, magnet uh, data or seismic data, usually in oil gas, different kinds of data that you can gather indirectly from the surface. You also have uh, different uh, uh, holes that you can do, tunnels, etc., to gather uh, actual data to see where you actually find gold, for example. In a mine, and you can train a system for that. We did a project like that for a company uh, uh, in Canada. And agriculture, for example, classifying crop types uh, in satellite image data. So we also work in the lab with, with this kind of data set where you have uh, satellite images, and usually you have some labeled data, but it's not randomly selected data some data set that someone actually cared to label and you want to apply that to different kinds of uh, other data sets uh, and see how well you can predict the the crop type for example um, climate that i said we started to work now uh, for example you you have the problem of downscaling the predictions of a physical model so sometimes you have very uh, the precipitation coming from get gorges or measurements that are uh, very close to, I mean, in a very high resolution. And you have uh, the model, the physical model gives prediction in a low resolution. And you, so you train the model to predict the high resolution given the low resolution to get a better estimate at a single neighborhood, for example. But then you want to apply this to another city, another place where you don't have the low resolution data. So how can you tell that it's possible to uh, use that same model in this different location, for example? So those are three examples where this is very clear um, and, and, and it can be casted as the same type of problem. So here's just some definition of a spatial domain. So, a spatial domain is a collection of finite volume elements in a coordinate reference system. And you could have either a 2D or a 3D spatial domain. So for example, in the case of agriculture and climate, we would talk about a, a 2D uh, domain. In the case of mining and oil and gas, we talk about 3D domain because we're looking at the, the subsurface, but this applies to both. And we assume that there is a, um, a stochastic process defined over the domain D, which is the spatial domain, which for each uh, location uh, generates um, some real uh, numbers that are the features of the, the model. For example, climate variables such as temperature, temperature T and precipitation P. So uh, one thing that is different in the case of uh, geospatial data from the regular uh, machine learning is that uh, we assume in most cases there is some kind of spatial correlation between the features, right? So if we have a, location, a feature observed at location U and a feature observed at location V, then the closer the locations, the more similar are the, the features. So here we're showing some examples of uh, temperature and, and river networks, etc., where um, you can see some examples of spatial correlations. So 
uh, we are defining actually a, a task, a machine learning task, which is this geostatistical transfer learning, where we assume that there is a source or training, as I was talking about in the beginning, spatial domain, and there is a target or test uh, uh, spatial domain. And then you have the joint distribution of features uh, for all locations uh, in these domains. And uh, you have two uh, spatial learning tasks, uh, TS and, and TT. So for example, here you have in the, in a, in crop, crop classification, you can have the band from the satellite and the crop type and you'd have uh, a domain here which is the source domain so you imagine that people have only labeled data in this region here and uh, and here you have another uh, target domain so you would want to uh, see how well you can transfer a model that it's learned here over to this uh, region here for example so as we are saying before, a classic way to select a good model for the problem is to use uh, cross-validation. So you would split, for example, you train a model uh, using uh, doing cross-validation over S1 and you split it into training and test here and you estimate the generalization error of the model and you find the best model that works for this region here for which you have the, the, the the training, the, the labels, for example, to train them on. And then you apply this to this other region here. So for some examples that we did, we get that this is like super optimistic uh, the, compared to, to the error, in, the real error in S2, right? That you, you can estimate. But the thing is that there are actually two problems here at play, right? One is that, um, one is similar to the covariate shift problem, or is the covariate shift problem, because if you train in some region and you test in a different region, here you would have a different distribution of, uh, of the training data. And you could also have uh, other types of shifts, like for example, the labels be different, et cetera. But you also have the problem of the spatial correlation. So the fact that, um, uh, you assume that lo closer locations have similar uh, values to other locations that are close by. This means that uh, the examples are not IID, right? Even if they were from, there were no covariate shift, like there are two uh, regions that are close by and they have very similar uh, features and very similar labels, etc. The fact that um, they are spatially correlated. When you do the cross validation, you lose the fact that they are ID. So there are no some. You could get some examples that are uh, on the training and on the test set, which are very uh, similar to to each other, for example. And this is not going to happen in the in the test domain because in the test domain you don't have any training examples. You only have unlabeled examples. So. Uh, here is just showing when you actually increase the spatial correlation. So this is simulated data, you get um, uh, deformation in the the space of features, showing that the examples are, are uh, not a IID. So here there are two uh, relevant properties. Let me just move this a little bit. I don't know why this happened. I didn't like this before. Okay, so we have two relevant properties. One is that uh, the spatial correlation uh, property that we have in this kind of problem, and also the covariate shift property. So um, we assume that here in this picture is showing that there is a in the in one domain we have one distribution of features in the other domain we have a different distribution but the function here uh, is still the same 
So when we think more generally about what we want to do in, in geostatistical machine learning, so we want to learn uh, a model, uh, y equals F hat, that approximates F in the least expected risk sense for some spatial loss function L. So in the more general case, we, would we could have a spatial loss here instead of having a pointwise loss, which is the most common uh, case in machine learning. And in this point uh, pointwise loss, we would consider, for example, to penalize non-contiguous predictions because we know that they are not uh, likely to, to occur, for example, because of this, we know in this geophysical law, for example, that labels the data, this could never happen. So we would penalize uh, models that would, would do that. So in, this would be the more general thing that we would frame as the as a, a loss function for, for geostatistical learning. But we also um, look into pointwise learning because it's a, a more simple case to actually reduce to the problems of, uh, of machine learning, but at least we know what we are doing. So in this case, we assume that the loss function is pointwise. So for each example, we we test uh, whether uh, what is the, the loss here for a certain label and a certain prediction. And we try to find the, the learning process is, is trying to find the minimum here of the expected value of the loss. Um, but we are, still using the, the spatial location uh, inside the, the, the cross-validation procedures that, as I'm going to uh, show us. So at no point while it's learning with a single model is a very simple type of statistical learning. It is uh, the most widely used approach because we can uh, reduce it to the uh, to the machine learning model that we can train classifiers. But as I said, we are still going to consider the spatial uh, characteristics of the data. So we would, uh, we are now gonna look into what would be different kinds of cross-validation procedures that uh, can be used in the setting. So the, the, the cross-validation, the classical cross-validation would be, as I said, not very uh, useful here because predictions, uh, it, 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 when there is spatial correlation, it tends to overestimate the, the value uh, in, in cases that are too close to the test, test points, or to the training points. So if you have a test point here that is uh, close to a training point, when you train the model in the source domain, it's actually going to have seen a very similar example. When you move to the test domain, it won't see any neighbors of the, the of that um, example. So for this reason, people actually developed uh, for the spatial domains without doing this theory behind it, but have uh, actually thought about doing block cross-validation. So for example, uh, for each uh, example, uh, in, instead of doing the, the random sampling, you um, take a point here, uh, to, a block here to use as validation. And then you have a dead zone around this where you don't use any training examples coming from this and you only sample training examples coming from here to test in this place. So in this case, you are trying to avoid the, the spatial correlation. You're saying, okay, since I'm actually moving to another domain where I don't have nearby examples, I should avoid nearby examples when estimating the error. And there's also a leave ball out validation, which is similar, but you, instead of using a block, uh, you use a, a ball around the, the point the problem is that here, you could have uh, some bias due to this systematic selection of code, for example. And also it's not dealing with the covariate shift problem. It's only dealing with the spatial correlation of the, the data problem. 
then there is the density ratio uh, validation, which is appropriate in the presence of covariate shift. So this is um, what I talked about in, in the beginning of the, the call, which is in this context, I would weigh the um, examples by this, uh, the probability of finding a certain example X in the target domain divided by the probability of finding this example X in the source domain. And uh, conceptually, you would have weights and, and this kind, this area here, for example, of the source domain would be weighted more heavily if this is the kind of data that appears more frequently in, in, the, in the target domain. And so in the cross-validation procedure, you would actually estimate the count the errors here more than counts the error here. It's a very simple thing. But again, you have to use methods for estimating the, the error. So to finalize, I'll show some uh, computational uh, experiments that we did comparing these uh, different, um, sorry, the different estimation methods using um, two data sets. One is a synthetic data set and the other one is a real data set from uh, oil and gas. So here we uh, wanted to very much manipulate the, the cases of, or types of uh, covariate shifts that we had. So we created some using Gaussian processes, we created data sets where the target was inside the source and another data set where the target was partially uh, with the source and another one which was uh, completely outside. So uh, these two types of uh, covariate shifts uh, we, we tried was the mean shift and a, a variance uh, shift. So in the mean shift, we only change the, the mean of the, of the data and in the variance shift, we, sh we change the, the variance of the data. So we define uh, three kinds of shifts configurations to analyze how this would go. Um, and we are doing this, um, the simulations here, assuming different uh, amounts of spatial correlation. So, we are actually analyzing both shift and spatial correlation, right? So if uh, here we have three uh, spatial correlation lengths for the, the process, and you can see how this is simulated with uh, what would be the, the results for R equals 20. And, and so the learning task uh, is to predict a binary variable at uh, locations given the observations of the variable uh, yu at locations u. So you predict the, and the true labeling function is a alternating uh, pattern in the feature space. So here is uh, what we used as the labeling. So we have feature z1 and z2, and we have this alternating pattern here as the labeling in this synthetic data set. So for each shift and for each, uh, spatial correlation and we use two kinds of machine learning models here decision trees and KNN for simplicity because these are um, faster to, to run and uh, we sample a statistical learning problem we estimate the error uh, using CV block cross validation and then duration validation and we estimate the actual error with Monte Carlo simulation. So we, since we control the labeling, we can estimate what would be the error of the, the true labeling on the, the test set. And we plot uh, error versus the total covariate shift. And we use three different definitions of covariate shift. Uh, 
Cobalt Library Divergency, Jack for Distance, and this uh, novelty factor. Sorry about this. I don't know why it's cutting here, but I um, can show you later if someone wants to know more detail about this formula. But these are basically three ways to uh, compute given two distributions, uh, know whether or not they are uh, similar or not, right? So, so we first we uh, plotted the to actually see which function to look into the shift, which one would be good. Uh, uh, be good for this data, for example, what would be a good function to measure the, the covariate shift. And uh, here you have the nearest neighbor models and you have the decision tree models. And we're applying the error of the true error of the model versus the, the covariate shift. So when we uh, use the, the nearest neighbor, you can see that uh, as we increase the, the covariate shift, I mean, according to that specific function, right? We have KL divergency, Jacquard distance, and novelty factor. So as we increase the covariate shift, we would expect to get uh, more errors. The function that was more correlated, let's say with the true error, is the, uh, is the novelty factor. So for the experiments later on, we use novelty factor as a measure of the covariate shift here. So this was just to check how we would measure, uh, have a good way to, to measure what would be uh, the covariate shift. And we use this novelty factor function. And um, what we see is that cross-validation and block cross-validation are insensitive to covariate shifts um, as expected. So when we look into the, no matter the correlation length, uh, when we increase the, the covariate shift, we see the, uh, the error estimated by cross-validation, block cross-validation to stay the same. So it, it doesn't, change, of course, for example, cross-validation doesn't take that into account at all, doesn't know about the test set, so uh, it would be impossible to estimate. And block cross-validation is only looking into the spatial correlation of the training, removing that, so it actually increases the error prediction, but it's the same no matter what the covariate shift is. Then the DRV, which is actually doing the weighting to fix the covariate shift, is actually increasing here, so it's closer to the actual error. So it's when you uh, you get some better estimates here of the error that you would do with CV and BCV, uh, which is good. And then the correlation length uh, by the, the different methods, you can see that the BCV uh, estimates, actually it does, est it estimates a, a higher value than it should actually for the, uh, for the error here when we increase the, the correlation length. So it's overcorrecting the, because it's blocking data around in a way that is not uh, probably the size of the block is not uh, good for this, this data. So uh, the errors are, are sensitive to spatial correlation. So as we increase the, uh, the correlation length, uh, we get uh, better errors and the DRV uh, actually tries, but it doesn't get all the way to the error probably because uh, it doesn't have enough examples of the test examples to actually you know, estimate that well, but it does much better than, than the other two. So here you see the QQ plots. And the other experiment so, um, is uh, the New Zealand uh, data set, which is a public data set of wells. Uh, in New Zealand, which has 407 
well logs. Uh, and it's a 3D data set. So as I said, it's very common for us to have labeled data in, the, in some regions and not in different regions. So in this case, the labels are different layers of uh, uh, names of the different rock layers uh, in the wells. And if you train, uh, our experiments would be to say, okay, if I only have labels for one region, how well can I estimate the error for uh, a different region? So as I said, we are predicting the rock formation in offshore wells, given annotated formations in, in onshore wells. So here we're showing a little bit what was, is the distribution of features. So pairwise uh, showing the distribution. And you can see that there is definitely a change in the distribution of onshore versus offshore, right? There is a, some patterns here which are, uh, which are different. So it's not exactly the same distribution uh, of variables. And these are the covariates, which are the features that we use to learn. And they are plotted here. So the experiment is to estimate the generalization error of various pointwise models, logistic, rich regression, logistic regression, KNN, uh, naive base, IDL, perceptor, et cetera, uh, decision tree, and rank the models according to the different estimates, CV, BCV, DRV, and according to actual error on offshore target wells. So, uh, here you have the different machine learning models. Here you have the error uh, uh, in the source. And here we have the true error in the target, because in this case, we, we, we have the labels for the target as well. But of course, in many cases, we don't have the labels for the target. We wouldn't be able to estimate that. And our hope would be to use one of these metrics. So the DRV is the, the, the closest uh, in most cases, um, the BCV is conservative more than the, the CV. The CV is, uh, tends to be super optimistic, it tries to all uh, get, get uh, better you know, estimates than the uh, BCV and their view. And now we repeated the examples with shoved examples from onshore and offshore wells with no covariate shifts. And uh, CV is the closest to target error. BCV is, is conservative and consequently worse in this case. So it's not doing well. Um, probably because here we don't actually have a lot of spatial correlation since the wells are not... Um, that close together, right? So even though we have wells, uh, they are not all, uh, the distances among, among them is, are, are small, uh, are large, right? Even though in this picture, they look close by. So probably there's not a lot of spatial correlation and doing the BCV is only introducing some, some bias of not having random samples. And, uh, the DRV behaves similar with and without covariate shift. So in this case, there is no covariate shift and, and it's working uh, well anyway. So uh, in conclusions, we see that classical learning theory is not enough for just spatial applications due to spatial correlation and, and covariate shift. Here we showed some examples with geospatial data illustrating some of the unique challenges in the case of pointwise learning. There's also more work to do in terms of when you actually have a loss function that depends on, the, uh, on having uh, all the examples together, like not just one, classifying each example at a time, but having uh, a loss that depends on the uh, correlation, the spatial correlation of, of the examples as well. Uh, we formalized this geostatistical transfer learning and implemented it in this geostats.jl, which is a Julia library that Julio implemented, and it's uh, publicly available. So if people want to try, uh, 
uh, in their tasks some of these concepts that we presented here of uh, block class validation and density ratio. Uh, we have a different implementation of the LZ method for finding the weights for the density ratio. Um, so this is all now open source and, and available here in this the Geo, uh, stats library. And we're still finishing a paper to publish some of the results that I showed in the end. So this is not published yet. Okay, so um, I apologize for the, the noise. Uh, we are actually in a hotel and the place where I wanted to give the talk, the, the connection was not working. So I had to come to the reception and, and uh, I'm, sh I'm sorry for the, <laughs> the noise. I hope some of the content could be understood. So I'm open now to, to questions and, and thank you for paying attention. Well, thank you very much, Bianca. Um, if people have questions, they're free to open up the microphones now. Maybe, I mean, if there are many questions, you should write your name down the, the chat window first. Or if you want, you can write down your question and I'll, and I'll phrase it to Bianca, I'll read it to Bianca. Okay, I, I have one question, um, which is, I guess that, you know, I mean, part, the reason why you, you believe that there is no shift in the distribution of Y given X is that you assume that somehow, well, the labels you're trying to infer, they are functions of some physical parameters, right? And I mean, that's the F function that you show. You show the change in the covariate distribution, but the Y doesn't, the distribution of Y given X doesn't change. And that's presumably because Y is a function of some, uh, or some probabilistic function of geophysical parameters. But uh, the question that was sort of lingering in my mind is that, uh, in practice, you wouldn't quite expect it to be a, a function, right? It's a function F, fixed function F. You expect to have some noise. So it's, I mean, it shouldn't be the case that with some covariates, you're able to exactly guess why. So it, does that make a difference in your framework? I mean, because you use the word function, so I was sort of wondering if that's somehow relevant. Yes, yeah, so the, yeah, the assumption is that it, the, the labeling function doesn't stay the same, but because it uses the same framework as the traditional learning theory, it is, a. Um, it, it does, it assumes that there is a probability of Y given X, right? It's not a fixed uh, function. So it's using the same machine learning methods as the, the other ones, but it's assuming that this probability of Y given X stays the same when it's minimizing the, the loss function there. So it depends on how each machine learning method handles that. But the theoretical assumption is that it is a, uh, probability of y given x that is governing the, uh, the process. Um, but then, yeah, of course, in these examples, you could assume that there is a, uh, a shift also in the labeling. So, for example, in the that somehow the relationship between the, especially because you don't have many variables, there could be some hidden variable that uh, actually is causing the, the Y and you don't know it. And then that will change the relationship between Y and X, basically because there is a hidden causal variable that you are not seeing. And, and uh, even if the physical process stays the same, like, so that's, that, that could reduce to some uh, label, changing the probability of Y given X if you don't have all the X. So you, assumption is that you would have to have all the axes that are relevant for predicting Y, uh, you don't have any hidden variable and that this probability of Y given X doesn't change. Yeah, I'm not sure you can hear me, but uh, I'm sorry, I lost my connection for a few seconds. So we, we can hear well, let me thank, good, good. So let me thank Bianca again for the very nice presentation.